thanks everyone. Uh, happy World Oceans Day. Um, great, to, uh, great to be here. My name is Rob Christie. Uh, I've just started as Assistant Secretary within the uh, Human Development and Governance Division within DFAT. Uh, and I'm abs it's an absolute thrill that, uh, that the Australia Awards are now part of uh, that division. So it's fantastic to be here. I'm also delighted to say that uh, what comes with the position is, is co-chair of the uh, as the Women in Leadership uh, Initiative Steering Committee, which is, which is great. I'm really looking forward to being a part of that. Um, look, it's great to be here in this event uh, hosted by the Women's Leadership Initiative and our research uh, partners, the uh, ANU's Department of Pacific Affairs. Uh, many thanks to the WLI team and uh, also DPA for pulling together uh, this fantastic event. Uh, to start with, of course, a, an acknowledgement of country. Today we're meeting on Ngunnawal country. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians uh, at the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and I extend that uh, respect to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, present here today. Uh, look, that acknowledgement is, is very relevant of course because uh, you know, as we discuss sustainable uh, use of our environment it's crucial that we do draw on the deep knowledge and uh, extensive experience uh, uh, built up over millennia our traditional practices uh, in the sustainable use of our environment. Uh, just to say a few words about the Women's Leadership uh, Initiative, WLI. Uh, DFAT is a very uh, proud supporter and funder of the WLI. Uh, we see it as a gold standard, essentially, of um, uh, leadership enrichment program uh, for our Australian Award scholars uh, in, uh, from Pacific Island countries. Uh, at its heart, the WLI uh, supports Australia's awards uh, women scholars from Pacific Island countries uh, studying at Australian uni universities to fulfil their uh, leadership potential to drive big ideas and reforms uh, in their communities. WLI has uh, dual outcomes. It's a serious women's leadership program based on a nuanced understanding of developmental leadership and political challenges. Uh, the concept uh, of leadership within WLI is based on practice of development leadership and approach uh, focus not only on uh, positional authority uh, but on how leadership is exercised uh, wherever we are. So uh, within politics, government, business and community. Uh, developmental leadership is also about working through networks and coalitions uh, to drive change and, and meet challenges. So uh, second, WLI has very strong uh, public diplomacy and person-to-person -person impacts uh, to deepen uh, Australia's relationship with uh, Pacific Island countries, helping to leverage and amplify the impact of Australia Awards. Uh, WLI has built influential networks across Pacific Island countries uh, with a range of female and male Pacific Island leaders. Uh, and through learning and networking events like this one today, uh, WLI has helped uh, Pacific scholars here in Australia and back home to connect with each other uh, and with members of the wider academic and policy communities. Um, all, while all while learning and talking about uh, you know, some of the big issues that confront us, uh, their, their countries in the broader Pacific region. I'm particularly excited that one of our own uh, WLI participants, uh, Amelia here today from Tonga, is one of the headline speakers for today's event. Uh, to me, this confirms that the knowledge, energy and passion needed to tackle some of the regions and indeed the world's uh, toughest challenges are already here, uh, you know, within our current cohort of Australia Award Scholars. And that with the support of uh, programs such as WLI, uh, scholars like Amelia have the capacity to bring about positive uh, changes in their region today. So just a quick plug about uh, some of the numbers behind WLI that uh, are really fantastic and it's been an absolute uh, privilege to essentially join and uh, support the program from within DFAT. Uh, Amelia is one of 127 women scholars from 10 Pacific Island countries who have participated in the WLI leadership and mentoring program since it began in uh, 2018. Uh, and one of many hundreds of uh, men and women scholars who have joined WLI's uh, learning and networking events like this one today. Uh, through the leadership and mentoring program, WLI is building connections between Pacific and Australian women of influence in a range of uh, professional sectors, 
from environmental management, uh, Amelia's expertise, to medical research, public health, nursing, geospatial science, disaster management, engineering, architecture, law, cyber, uh, finance, agriculture, food security. You get the idea. Um, one example, fantastic example of an individual WLI alumni is um, for the Fiji's first uh, female director uh, of the National Disaster Management Office, Vasiti Soko. Uh, so Vasiti did her Masters of uh, Geospatial Science at RMIT in Melbourne. And Vasiti led uh, Fiji through three tropical cyclones, a declared disaster, flash floods, storm surges, etc., and is now leading the NDMO uh, as part of Fiji's national response to the COVID crisis. Last year, we started uh, innovations to deepen the program reach, such as uh, the new Leadership uh, Connect 2020 online program, uh, which therefore was open to a larger group of some 90 female and male scholars from Pacific Island countries. And I understand the second Leadership Connect program is planned uh, to commence later this year, which is fantastic. Uh, and the new uh, COVID leadership uh, projects implemented by 15 teams of WLI participants in six home countries are really showing uh, and demonstrating developmental uh, leadership in action across uh, these countries to address the COVID-19 impacts. Uh, can I suggest you have a look at some of the recent uh, video stories uh, on these projects on the WLI YouTube playlist uh, on the DFAT Australia Awards channel. Um, and uh, just absolutely uh, love it. It's a, it's a fantastic example of uh, people just really connecting uh, through the program. As discussed at the meeting, uh, co-convened by our Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne, uh, and the Honourable uh, Fiame uh, Mata'afa, uh, then Samoan Deputy Prime Minister of 30 Pacific uh, Women Leaders mid last year. Uh, recovery from COVID-19 must take into consideration uh, the differentiated impacts the, the pandemic is having on women, men and vulnerable groups. Uh, recovery will require active coalitions of women and men uh, committed to bring uh, women's voice and agency to COVID-19 decision making. Uh, so WLI is playing its uh, role to progress the agenda. Uh, thank you all uh, once more for coming along today. I'd like to hand over now to today's uh, moderator, uh, Rachel England. Thanks, Rachel. Thank Cheers. you, Robert. Yuma, Yuma Lundi, welcome. I too want to acknowledge the country that we're currently on, which is Ngunnawal, Nunawal and Nambri lands. Uh, and also acknowledge the country where I was born and raised, Wiradjuri country in New South Wales. And state, pay my deep respects to this place and the elders and state that these lands have never been ceded. They are still Aboriginal land. Uh, Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Rachel England. I'm a PhD scholar at, the, at ANU at the Fenner School of Environment and Society. Uh, and I am doing research with women on Tanner Island in Vanuatu and also up in the northwest of Australia in the Kimberley region, the Nigata and Mangala women. They're looking at and critiquing the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But more importantly today are these two women sitting next to me. And it is my great honor to be here in conversation with them today about the blue economy. Uh, because not only are they fantastic women and great scholars, they're also really good dancers, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> and they know how to carve it up. We might see a little bit of that later. <laughs> but we have here Amalia Faltusia. Did I say that correctly? Thank you. Sorry. Amalia Fartusia and Pip Louie. Uh, Amalia is an Australian Awards Scholar and a participant of the Women's Leadership Initiative. She's undertaking a Master's of Environmental Management and Development here at ANU, focusing her research on her home of Tonga and also on exploring ocean conservation and ocean financing opportunities. But before ANU, Amalia was an economist with the Tongan government uh, in the development aid unit and also was the Tongan representative at the 2020 Pacific Ocean Finance Fellowship Program. So Amalia comes to us today with a wealth of experience already. 
Here we have Pip, who's a shiny new PhD scholar at ANU's Department of Pacific Affairs, so she's still very excited about her research. <laughs> <laughs> Pip's research is exploring the blue economy in the Pacific, uh, with particular focus on where the benefits flow. Particularly, do they flow to people and places on the ground? Um, and before her PhD, Pip interned at PANG, which is the Pacific Network on Globalisation, and she's currently an engagement officer at the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council. So again, a wealth of experience here on the panel today. Can you all please join me in encouraging Emily and Pip? So we're going to get straight into this, but first I just want to point someone out. Recently my nine-year-old said to me that she thinks the blue economy is where all of the world's money is sad and lonely. <laughs> now, is that true? What is the blue economy, <laughs> please share with us? Rachel actually gave me a bit of a heads up that she would be throwing this question to me first, and I'm glad that she did because it's, it's really fuzzy um, what the blue economy is. Um, it's a very sensible place to start for this conversation. Um, in its broadest term, um, I would say the blue economy is promoted as an agenda for sustainable ocean development. Um, so similar to the broader notion of sustainable development, it tries to um, commit to promises towards environmental sustainability, um, economic growth, and on the social aspect, the terminology varies, but it ranges from things from livelihoods through to um, employment, inclusion, and participation. Um, so lots of definitions that you'll hear about the blue economy kind of go along a formula of the blue economy um, attempts to maximise the potential of oceans um, through economic growth, improvement of livelihoods and a commitment to ocean conservation um, and protection. Now, if that definition is quite ambiguous and not very satisfactory to you, um, you are not alone. Um, I, something that I really struggle with the, blue, with the blue economy is there are so many questions that are raised from just that basic definition, um, questions around what does economic growth look like? Who is it to? So is it commercial economic growth? Is it for states? Is it for communities on the ground? Um, what do we mean by socioeconomic growth? Um, does development growth look the same as kind of commercial growth? Um, and then with environmental sustainability, are we looking at actively restoring ocean health, which we know um, is in a really dismal position at the moment? Um, or are we just talking about minimising the impact on oceans? Um, so um, some of you may have encountered the blue economy alongside other terms such as sustainable ocean economy, blue growth, ocean economy. Um, there are lots of different terms floating around at the moment um, and trying to pin them down is quite difficult. Um, so I'm just going to open up Pandora's box <laughs> um, and just say that the yeah, broadly the blue economy is in reference to sustainable ocean development. Um, from there, there are lots of different interpretations um, and I might hand over to Amelia to flesh that out. <laughs> wow, so many ideas, but um, I think uh, what Pip said is very true in that the blue economy is, it's quite broad. It includes, it includes a lot of sectors of the economy, including tourism, fisheries, um, a lot of sectors that have to do directly and indirectly with the ocean. Um, and in terms of what it means for specific regions of the world, it really comes down to those specific regions and how they define it for themselves. Um, for the Pacific, I know that we're going to talk about it more yeah. later. Yeah, um, right. It would basically be an intersection of economy, livelihoods and culture. Um, and that is what the blue economy actually is. But then at the same time, um, a lot of conversations and dialogues have yet to be had about the specific components of what it really means for specific countries of the Pacific. Mm. So, um, who, a lot are, of, who yeah. are the main players in the game for the blue economy? Like at the global level. Mm. Um, at the global level, the really the dominant drivers, um, you would say, are probably the UN um, and its. Uh, different agencies. They've been doing a lot of work around the blue economy, um, as well as the World Bank. Um, the EU has a very strong blue economy program, which has shifted from blue growth into blue economy as they've tried to increase the sustainability appeal within it. Um, so they've been really driving the agenda since about 2012. Um, that said, it really is the Pacific Islands who have been at the forefront of 
bringing the blue economy to the global stage. Um, so there were rumblings around the blue economy, um, probably starting about as early as 2009, um, but it was the Pacific Islands um, through PSIDS that really took it to the global stage and said, this is an idea that we want to talk about. Um, it was around the Rio uh, Plus 20 conference, so there was the theme of green growth, which was being talked about, um, and PSIDS um, as well as SIDS in general um, were saying, we have big ocean economies, we'd like this to be considered. Um, and so the Pacific Island nations have been very active in driving it, um, potentially less so in terms of actually implementing it, um, but very, very strong drivers in terms of trying to define what this agenda is about. Emily, are you aware of any um, uh, examples or case studies globally where the blue economy is being rolled out and is working well or is achieving the outcomes that are intended for it, maximising ocean development? Yeah, um, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, cases that could that Pacific could learn from um, in other small island developing state regions like the um, Caribbeans, for example. I know that Seychelles is a very active player in the international stage of promoting the blue economy um, and they have specific institutions dedicated to implementing it at the national level. So I think in terms of the Pacific's context, they could look at other regions that um, are perhaps at the same level or stage of development mm -hmm. and learn from them um, in terms of how they've gone about um, implementing the blue economy and how they are seeing the blue economy unfold in the future for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pip, yeah. what about issues? Of, is the blue economy being critiqued at the global level? Yes. Um, so <laughs> uh, the blue economy... <laughs> There are the very strong advocates of it, um, and so you will see lots of conferences popping up at the moment around the blue economy. Um, it's, it kind of is the buzzword that's being used in the international forum, but there's a very strong mirror side to that, um, where, where critics are questioning what it actually means to increase ocean activities, because um, that is really what the blue economy is trying to do at its very heart. Um, the blue economy kind of has two streams that run along it. There's an attempt to expand traditional economies, um, so that's things like fisheries, ports, um, and an attempt to expand them and make them more efficient um, and just generally increase their productivity. But then there's also another line that runs along the blue economy that's really dedicated to emerging industries. Um, so through the blue economy, you're starting to see lots of industries such as um, seabed mining, um, really latching onto it, as well as things like um, marine biodiversity um, and the pharmaceutical industry are also engaging very heavily with the um, blue economy. And so a lot of critics are looking at the blue economy and saying, is this just a form of ocean industrialisation? Um, and is it kind of being used as, um, I know that Pang and Dawn um, have kind of described it as smoke and mirrors. Is it being used as smoke and mirrors um, to just enable ocean industrialisation, um, which which kind of speaks to sustainability, um, but struggles to deliver that on the ground. Um, the agenda is about 10 years old, um, and so it is still emerging, um, but we have to look quite carefully at it because you have areas such as the EU in particular is very strong on the emerging industries front. Um, if you look at their priority areas, they're pretty much their aquaculture, seabed mining, offshore renewables, um, uh, bioprospecting, and I've forgotten the fifth one, um, but they're all very emerging industry focused. Um, but then you have areas like the Pacific, which still have an emerging, emerging industry interest, um, but because of marine tourism, um, as well as fisheries, you can understand that these industries are huge. And so the Pacific are looking at the traditional sector um, a lot more strongly than um, some other regions around the world. So it, it requires close attention would definitely be my caution on that. Beautiful segue because my next question was let's now zoom into the Pacific and have a look at what the blue economy is there or even what you, go, you both think uh, it should be. So Amalia, how, how is the Pacific currently conceptualising the blue economy? Yeah, I think there are a lot of um, a lot of terms out there, including uh, blue Pacific, blue economy, ocean economy. Um, and at the regional level, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of policies uh, and strategies in support of ocean conservation, particularly within the um, regional organizations such as Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, mm -hmm. um, specifically their office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner. Um, and I think there is um, 
there is now focus in terms of what it potentially means for ocean governance, um, but then in terms of what it means for specific sectors that are important for Pacific Island economies like tourism and fisheries, um, there is still a lot of analysis and research that needs to go into that. Um, so a lot of innovation in terms of science and data and information, um, which island economies um, particularly struggle with, um, require investment in order to determine what um, the concrete instruments, policy instruments and institutions are that these governments require um, in order to roll out um, the blue economy, whether it's through ongoing marine spatial planning processes that they're currently undertaking or through um, ocean financing instruments that support implementation of ocean conservation initiatives, um, there needs to be sort of a strategy in place that governments come up with um, that guide their efforts in implementing ocean conservation um, at the national and regional levels. So the Blue Pacific document is not this? It's not a plan for the blue economy? Um, I think the Blue Pacific, this is what I think, I think it's the Pacific's version of what the blue economy means for themselves because like I said earlier, it's really founded upon an intersection of um, econo economic growth, livelihoods and culture. And culture is an important one for the Pacific. Um, and in order to coin their sort of version, I think they've come up with that um, phrase, the blue Pacific. And um, ongoing efforts, I, I'm, I'm sure maybe some of you would know, um, are going on in terms of uh, the region's efforts towards formulating a blue Pacific continent strategy um, and dialogue around the blue economy and what it potentially means in a Pacific setting, like I said earlier, would definitely feed into that process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. I think it, the, it is really interesting to see that relationship between the blue economy and the blue Pacific. Um, as I, I mentioned a bit earlier, the Pacific were really heavily involved in bringing the blue economy as a term to the global stage. Um, but then since 2017, where they started um, formulating the blue Pacific narrative, um, it, it's kind of become a really murky, um, the relationship between those two. So in 2017, there was um, talk about how the Blue Pacific, one of its three pillars, would be a Pacific blue economy. Um, and that was explicitly stated in 2017. But since then, the blue economy has kind of dropped out of reference when talking about the Blue Pacific. That does not mean that there is not um, a consideration of what a sustainable ocean economy could look like within the Blue Pacific. There definitely is. Um, but it's really interesting to just note that that explicit term blue economy has kind of dropped away in recent discussions. Um, so for me, that raises questions about, you know, is the Pacific actively moving away from it? Um, is, has it kind of been subsumed within this broader blue Pacific agenda? Um, it, it's just a, a bit of a puzzle that's sitting there and I'm nowhere near close to having any answers to it. Um, but it is really interesting that um, the blue Pacific is going to be, it's likely going to be a really big defining um, kind of identity for the region. Um, and it will be interesting to see how the sustainable ocean development is brought into that, um, whether it will be totally separate to the blue economy um, or if it will be kind of related um, but potentially masked. Yeah. Right. And I also think um, in terms of, of the differences or maybe, you know, how they reinforce or conflict each other, um, the main consideration that they have in common is that there is recognition that there needs to be, um, that the ocean needs to be conserved for future generations, not just economic growth. And at the same time, a consideration that economic growth and um, ocean conservation should be compatible practices and not um, exclusive. Do you see any tensions between the Pacific's view of what the blue economy is or should be and it, the more global um, De definitions or concepts like at the UN, for example? I think there are definitely a lot going on at the international level in terms of what the blue economy means globally and for main regions and developed countries. Um, but I think when it comes down to implementation and outcomes on the ground for small island developing states, especially with you know very limited resources, 
um, there is a disconnection in terms of how information and priorities on the international level, um, which also includes you know, missions um, and, and people from capital who are participating in those international processes, how those priorities and outcomes translate um, and transition down to um, you know, actual action on the ground in terms of you know, relevant government departments, um, civil society, private sector, how they on the ground implement those top level international priorities. So um, I think that's uh, probably a question for diplomacy or the way that they do business in the diplom uh, diplomatic um, sphere of things. But I think it's, it's a prominent concern um, that small island states with limited capacities and in terms of numbers, you know, these missions usually have three or four people. They can't cover all of these events, all the events that go on at the international level, mm. um, how that, you know, impacts or even funnels down if it does. Um, and as Amelia touched on a bit earlier as well, there is quite a distinctive Pacific version of a blue economy. Um, so it, it covers things like culture, um, identity, um, recognition that there is this deep connection um, with the oceans, especially for coastal communities. Um, some other interesting elements um, of the Pacific versions of blue economies, there's a big emphasis on maritime boundaries. Um, that's probably very unsurprising to most of you given um, climate change and the threats of sea level rise and how that will affect um, exclusive economic zones. Um, the Pacific also has a, a really interesting emphasis around um, recovery um, and how how the um, blue economy can be used in a kind of a post-COVID um, manner um, to help build up um, economies. That's something that's being discussed globally, um, but with the Pacific, that's really pressing, particularly on the marine tourism front. Um, so there are kind of differences um, between a Pacific version um, and a global version, more so in terms of where the emphasis is. Um, the Pacific has been very committed to um, marine protected areas, um, so they're doing a lot of work around um, trying to progress. They're, they're, a lot of nations are actually progressing towards a 30% um, uh, area of their exclusive economic zones being under marine protection. Um, I think the global standard for that is really seeing about 10%. The 10% is kind of like the global aim. The Pacific is aiming for 30%. Um, so there are just different emphases that are kind of being put between the global and the Pacific. Um, a lot of those are very understandable. Um, one final thing that I would say as well is that it's interesting to watch how the Blue Pacific has emerged or potentially been diluted down um, as an agenda for redistributing um, the benefits that arise from the oceans. So the Pacific had put a foot forward very early on um, and said that we want to maximise our use of the oceans and a large part of that is so that we can get a, a greater share um, of the ocean economies that we are driving. Um, fisheries being a good example um, with trying to keep the profits that come um, from the fisheries within the Pacific rather than all those profits being shot overseas. Um, and that really strong emphasis on kind of sovereignty over resources and the resource profits um, has been a, a strong line in the Pacific. It is something that is overlooked very frequently um, in global discussions. Um, so ever since a lot of the, uh, I suppose, more developed states and the more developed regions have jumped on this blue economy bandwagon, they've kind of used it as a form of just economic, economic growth, not looking at how we distribute those benefits um, and trying to do equal distribution. Um, so that is, yeah, that's an, an interesting dynamic to watch. Um, it will, it'll, we'll have to see where that goes, um, but it is something that's definitely emerging. Great. Uh, now I'd like to look closer at this promise or potential question mark that was in the title of today's talk uh, and really just sort of zone into the Pacific and some actual case studies or examples across the Pacific of where the blue economy is actually still working. Because still, I'm still actually thinking that it is money that's very sad and lonely and that's what's going on. <laughs> that's what the blue economy is. So can you give some real tangible examples of the blue economy playing out now or potentially playing out into the future across the Pacific? Okay. Emily, um, you're first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think um, in terms of examples, um, concrete examples, uh, that is yet to be seen. But there are so many oceans-related processes and strategies in place 
that are already sort of forming the foundation for a transition or improving um, business practices in support of, you know, sustaining and conserving the ocean. Um, in Tonga, for example, there is the um, marine spatial planning process that is currently ongoing, um, which basically entails, you know, uh, trying to ensure that there is co coordination um, in terms of the uses and, you know, the spatial use of the ocean. Um, and in, a, in parallel with that, in support of implementing that um, within the next few years or so, there is um, a national strategy that is currently being formulated, um, termed the National Ocean Strategy for Tonga. Um, and at the same time, um, given those institutions currently, you know, being put in place, there is also a concern about financing and how um, the role of financing in financing the transition and implementing the blue economy. Um, Ecotourism in Tonga um, is seen as, you know, a potential for ocean financing, um, where businesses such as seaside resorts or, um, you know, the services that they provide like snorkeling or traditional sea, sea navigation um, initiatives could potentially generate revenue in support of um, ocean conservation initiatives, um, such as, you know, replanting mangroves or um, community, local community initiatives that could help. But that... Emily, would that be like a government-run program, that kind of fin ocean financing? So that would, similar to like what Palau has, where they take... I think, well, I mean, yeah. it's, it's currently a conversation that's ongoing, right. but then I think um, we also need to use uh, the potential of the private sector um, mm -hmm. through ecotourism in support of that, because government has, you know, very thin resources that mm -hmm is already being uh, complemented by foreign aid. So um, I think ecotourism would be a, a really good avenue going forward. Um, in terms of the specifics, we need you know, regulations, institutions in place in support of implementing them. Um, but then uh, I think in terms of the marine spatial planning exercise that's going on, um, ocean financing would really help to, as a means of implementation for it. So mm. yeah. I think that's, a, that's sort of the closest example that I could provide from Tonga. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Mm. Pip? Um, as far as examples go, a couple that come to mind. Um, there's the uh, Blue Pacific Shipping Partnership. Um, so that is one that's aimed at decarbonising the shipping sector, um, including ports as well. So there's, um, it's kind of partnered with this Green Ports Initiative. Um, so the, there have been, I think there are five nations that are coming together under the Blue Pacific Shipping Partnership to try and decarbonise um, Pacific fleets. Um, so it, it doesn't touch on the ones that come from external to the region, but the Pacific fleets. Um, and I think they've, they've got some really ambitious targets. It's like 40% by, to decarbonise by 40% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So big targets out there. Um, another very interesting example um, is how the blue economy has emerged in relation to seabed mining. Um, so the Cook Islands is a good example of that. Um, the blue economy is kind of being used as a way to legitimise um, seabed mining in the exclusive economic zones um, of the Cook Islands. Um, Yes, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, and then there's also uh, lots of work around marine protected areas. Um, so uh, there's, um, that ranges in scales as well. So we have large marine protected areas, um, such as the um, Phoenix Islands protected area, which is in Kiribati, um, the Cook Islands has Marae Moana. Um, there, there are quite a few large marine protected areas in the region. Um, they're being driven in partnership by government as well as often charitable trusts, so things like Pew Charitable Trust. Um, Conservation International is also very heavily involved. Um, so the Blue Economy is being used to promote those kind of big marine parks. Um, some of them are no take zones, so you're not allowed to fish there. Um, and often it does allow for local fishing, but no commercial fishing practices. Um, some of them are more tourism focused. So like in um, Palau, there's a shark sanctuary as well in the protected area, um, which is there to help promote um, tourism um, and to gain money effectively from sharks. Um, by having sharks around, you can gain a lot of money um, from the tourism sector. 
Um, and then you also, on the other end of the marine protected area, um, you have locally managed marine areas. Um, so there's a lot of work going on through many um, of the nations, Samoa, um, Solomon Islands, Fiji come to mind, um, with having um, locally, marine, locally managed marine areas. So um, that's working um, with the communities to, yeah, uh, to give coastal communities and to recognise um, the responsibility and the governance that coastal communities have had for decades, thousands of years um, over these um, aquatic resources. Um, and by kind of patchworking these together, um, you end up with a larger marine area as well. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of work on trying to see how those networks um, can relate to one another. So there, that's kind of like the diversity, um, I suppose, of the blue economy in the Pacific. If I could just add, yes. um, I think uh, Tonga today, in celebration of World Oceans Day, they have finally announced that they've reached their 30% target for MPAs. Um, and that, I think, is a key feature in terms of the blue economy potentially rolling out in Tonga. Um, I, th I think they're called um, locally marine protected areas um, and how tourism um, resorts, seaside resorts, help in financing the implementation of them. So um, I, I'm aware that I think um, one of the outer islands in Tonga sets aside a bit of their profits in support of um, helping with things like uh, boats for surveillance in SMAs. Um, and you know, it's those sort of mechanisms that sort of follow up and support the objectives of the blue economy in conserving the ocean that um, has potential for Tonga and many Pacific islands. Yeah. yeah. Great. So uh, now it is, we'll open the floor for questions. I ask you that when uh, you're selected to ask the question that you please just introduce yourself. And then uh, if you're directing your question to people or Amelia, then just, just say that so we know who's, who, who's going to tackle it and then ask your question. Who would like to ask? Yes. Okay, yes. I'm Judith Cabey and I'm actually a historian. So, so, uh, I love the talk, I love the aspirations and, and, and the hope, but also I sense some, some ambiguities here. And so as a historian, I'm going to ask why uh, uh, economic exploitation of the ocean wouldn't follow or wouldn't result in the well-worn paths of enriching a few powerful actors and impoverishing people's and the, and the earth or the oceans. I argue that that would be a, a very strong risk that is being run at the moment. Um, there has been some recent research um, looking at the top 100 ocean-based companies across a range of different industries, ships, fisheries, etc. And 60% of the profits um, that are coming out of ocean industries go towards these top 100 companies. Um, so it's, it's these kinds of trends that are really worrying. Um, I think the Pacific has had an example of this as well with PNG's Nautilus seabed mining um, disaster, to be completely honest. Um, that was a project where it was going to be the world's first seabed mining project. Um, it was going to start up in the Pacific Islands um, in... Oh, 2000 and I think it was 2012. Can anyone correct me on that? It was kind of, you know, early 2000s-ish era, era, era. Um, and it just absolutely collapsed, mainly for financing reasons, um, and it left the PNG government in a lot of debt. Um, and so it's these kinds of questions around the blue economy may encourage certain industries to enter into the area, but yeah, who, where do the profits run? Um, who are they going to? Um, I think on the flip side of that, uh, an incredible success story, um, which I think is a good, almost like a, a counter example to the blue economy, um, is the parties of Nauru, Vessel Day scheme, um, so PNA, um, that has been incredibly successful um, in terms of generating um, profits and increasing the profits that Pacific nations are able to gain from tuna fisheries. Um, that launched before the blue economy was really much of a thing. Um, it's since kind of been brought into the blue economy, but it's not something that was originally conceived as any kind of blue economy idea. Um, but that has been unbelievably successful um, in 
generating income. Um, I think it's increased almost 10 percent um, over the last, sorry, <coughs> tenfold, not 10 percent, tenfold um, over the last decade. Um, so it is really quite incredible. Um, and the reasons for that success, um, Transform Akara has written a really phenomenal um, book called uh, Transform transforming fisheries, something along those lines, um, if you want to follow it up. But he's kind of followed the story. He, he was a, a really key player in it. Um, Fishing for Success, that's the book. Um, he was a really key player in it and he's written um, on it and just highlighted that, you know, by having regions and um, decision makers who actually are really interested in where these profits go, that's kind of owned by the region, um, that was key to the success of this um, and having kind of interests that were aligned rather than trying to pull together all these disparate parties um, that may have quite conflicting interests, that was also a key part of it. Um, so the blue economy, yeah, where will the profits run is I think is a very interesting question. That's kind of where I'm angling my research at the moment um, because on one hand it may generate some really good profits for local communities, on the other hand it, it may not and it's kind of asking is, is the bad, um, acceptable, given the good, um, or, or do they just, they're not um, compatible. Mm. Sorry, Amelia, did you want to add? Put it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Siobhan, yes. Hi. Uh, Siobhan McDonnell, I'm a senior lecturer in the Crawford School. Thank you for a really incredibly engaging panel. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think you've handled a, a whole range of really complex problems um, very adeptly. So thank you very much. Um, I want to push you a little bit on the intersection between the blue economy and the customer economy, because one of the things that worries me so much about the blue economy framing is this idea that, that there's nothing there to begin with. Um, mm. So I worry a lot about uh, marine protected areas, these big global players that come in and create marine protected areas without recognition of the kind of customary tenure arrangements that are already in place. And I particularly think about this from the perspective of uh, Melanesia, for example, where, you know, overwhelmingly you've still got people living a very customary existence, so subsistence economy. So I'm thinking about Ralph Reagan Barnu's work around around the customary economy. And I want to think a little bit more or ask you to, to kind of reflect on what is that? What are those points of intersection between the blue economy and the customer economy? What does that look like in practice? Hmm. Hi. Thank you for the question. I think it's a it's one of you know really relevant for the Pacific region um, as a region with very diverse and, and rich cultures and traditions um, that revolve around the ocean and um, impacts the way that they interact or use the ocean um, in support of their livelihoods. Um, I think a, a very sort of prominent example of um, a way in which the um, Tonga has sort of s tried to um, marry the two in a way that works for them is um, the way that they've set up their locally uh, SMAs, locally uh, marine protected areas. Um, which are managed by respective communities, um, but before uh, rights are handed over to those communities, um, government comes in um, and initially rights to those areas are uh, with um, government as state um, land. Um, and with government's agenda in support of the blue economy, they've come in, um, you know, tried to ra raise awareness at the local level. and. Um, through the establishment of marine uh, MPAs, I'll call it MPAs um, instead of MS SMAs, but MPAs, they've um, sort of uh, handed it over to the communities themselves to um, basically implement those SMAs according to what they think will work for themselves. And they've set up uh, community development um, committees who formulate uh, development plans for that specific community and it's you know centered around um, key priorities to them including you know their culture um, traditional practices and you know whether or not they value or um, create handicrafts that bring revenue to their community um, that revolves around you know using the ocean to create so um, I think that 
it is a very important question that still needs to be talked about at every level of um, Pacific Island nations. Um, and ultimately, it will come down to very specific contexts of different coastal communities and how much they're willing to drive the agenda themselves. I think something that's quite interesting on the front of <coughs> rendering oceans as open spaces, there's never been anything there before. There's lots of discussion in the blue economy, both actually within the Pacific as well as on a global stage, of trying to frame the oceans as frontiers, um, which I think is something that uh, is very concerning. Yeah, um, it, that's a, a discussion that's often brought into things like seabed mining, um, but it's not exclusive to seabed mining by any means. Um, trying to see, yeah, the, the oceans is this, um, it's often, yeah, a frontier of untapped wealth, um, and also development spaces, that's another one that's often used. Um, I know that Dawn and Pang have done quite a lot of um, work at really scrutinising large marine protected areas um, and the interactions that they have, um, particularly with fisheries, local um, coastal fisheries, um, because of the impacts that they can have on just local economies as well as subsistence. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are some really big concerns out there as to how the oceans are being framed within a blue economy. Um, it is a little bit different in the Pacific as well as um, other coastal islands. So the Caribbean um, has also started to infuse their blue economy, and I shouldn't say started, they have since the beginning, infused their version of the blue economy um, with recognition of oceans as agent life forms, whether that be cultural um, or just the fact that they're ecosystems, they are, they are living, there are services that are going on um, in the oceans. Um, but there is also that counter rhetoric around frontiers, open spaces, untapped wealth, um, which then ties back into kind of very Eurocentric visions of the ocean um, as the high seas, um, as um, Mayor Librem kind of, yeah, Hugo Grotius kind of um, style thinking along those lines. Yes. Hi, Amanda Watson from the Department of Pacific Affairs here at ANU. Uh, I've been researching undersea internet cables in the Pacific region in recent months. So I was just wondering if anyone on the panel has heard the blue economy referred to in relation to the subsea internet cables or any other services that are being provided through the ocean space. Thank you, Amanda, for that question. Um, uh, since your talk last week, I actually did a bit of research on it. Um, so I was like, how does this, how does this work? Here's one we um, prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, the so the um, Office of Pacific Ocean Commissioner, um, they have over the last two years been releasing a Blue Pacific Ocean report, um, which is kind of like a stock take of the Blue Pacific Ocean, um, which is very much blue economy focused. Um, and they have a section in there on submarine cables. Um, the interesting thing is they're not really talking about um, submarine cables as a as, um, kind of an economic growth opportunity. That said, it is a development opportunity because of the, the technologies that it can bring. Um, it's more kind of talking about submarine cables and how that could compete with other industries and just the crisscrossing nature, um, as you're very well aware, um, in the Pacific Ocean. So it is sort of there. Um, I wouldn't say it's one of the main industries that is being talked about, um, which I think is quite interesting because there there is economic gain in submarine cables, um, but it's not one that's kind of been flagged um, anywhere that I have yet seen. Um, that's not to say it's not somewhere else, but I haven't seen too much discussion of it. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to that? I think um, just in addition to that, what would be relevant is um, ongoing marine spatial planning processes because that ultimately determines how um, these Pacific Island countries will use the space, the marine territories that they have, which are quite extensive mm -hmm. and um, involve a lot of stakeholder engagement in order to determine what the priorities are, where you want to implement them, at what time, and how much space you allocate um, versus, you know, clashing or, you know, over, you deplete the ocean's resources by using too much space or, you know, too many uses in one place, for example. So I think that would be of use in support of that. Yes. Hello, I'm Judy from the Department of Pacific Research. And I know you talk a lot about the environment, sort of what is meant by the real economy. 
And so I'm just wondering if any of the strategies or policies that have been articulated talk about the end goal at all. Like, is there any sense of vision as to what the blue economy might deliver in a more tangible sense? I think it would, um, well, like, like I said earlier, it would come down to specific countries and their priorities. Um, I know that, for example, Tonga, um, a big part of it would have to do with locally marine protected areas um, and, you know, monitoring them, implementing them, ensuring that they are doing what we intended them um, for, um, ensure that the outcomes are being reaped. Um, and in just saying that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of um, we, we know what we want, like we can put priorities on the table, but in terms of implementing them, we would need a lot more resourcing, um, particularly financial resources from uh, development partners. Um, so yeah. those are marine protected areas for Tonga, are they more focused on um, conservation of those areas or is it more about livelihoods? for local communities? It, it's about both, um, because these these areas, um, they have take zones and no take zones. Mm -hmm. And those take zones are only open to members of that particular coastal community managing that area. Mm -hmm. So outsiders are not really allowed, unless they, they um, submit you know, a request to the community development um, committee that's responsible in that particular that community. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, both, both objectives are being addressed in terms of um, replenishing fish stocks, um, but also uh, catering for the food security of that specific community. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'd also add to um, marine protected areas is that, at, at least in my head when I was first thinking about marine protected areas, I was thinking of them as just conservation spaces, um, but they're actually for-profit conservation, many of them. Um, so some of the big ones like um, the, the Phoenix Island protected area, um, the, they're set up as, conserv as conservation for profit. Um, so through things like offsets um, or these permits that are given out to commercial fishers, um, that is how they raise revenue. Um, and some of that then goes back to the, the nation to then be able to keep running these marine protected areas. But that also then goes to whatever the partner organisation is, whether that be Pew Charitable Trust, Conservation International. Um, so as much as marine protected areas are sold along a conservation line, it is important to also recognise that there's an economic element, particularly to the large ones. Um, so it's, it's not all altruistic. Is your sense that by having designating, say, up to 30 percent of marine protected areas, that it's almost unfettered in terms of what happens to the remaining 70 percent? Like, is there a silence mm. surrounding what happens to the remaining 70 percent? I think there's, well, um, <coughs> MPAs are a problem just one of many uses of the ocean in Tonga and, you know, the Pacific. Um, you know, we, we trade also impacts the way that we use mm. our, our territories. And um, okay. in addition to that, we also have, um, you know, ecotourism operators operating in our waters. Um, we have a lot of swimming with the whales activities going on, snorkeling. Um, and then, yeah, so not just MPAs, but in addition to that, we'll have to allocate the way that we use the ocean space, the remaining 70% in a way that um, is aimed towards conserving it, um, hopefully conserving it, but also reaping economic benefits while conserving it for future generations. Um. And just very quickly, um, there's also a discussion around managing 100% of exclusive economic zones. So marine protected areas may take up 30%, may take up 80%, but there's kind of lots of discussion recently around we're going to manage 100% of our exclusive economic zones. Um, and that kind of falls into the marine spatial planning um, that Amelia was speaking about, um, which really just means that there are borders everywhere in the ocean now. Um, so where you know the ocean has really never had this many borders as we're trying to put up at the moment. Um, it's interesting there's been discussion around how what we're trying to do with ocean governance is very similar to just trying to map land governance onto mm -hmm. oceans um, and how that is quite tricky given the fact that oceans are by 
how they work fluid um, <laughs> things move through them um, so how do how do you actually you know map a territorial grid onto an ocean and manage 100% of what's going on um, and not only in exclusive economic zones we're starting to push that out into high seas as well whether that be through high seas pockets um, so Pacific's had lots of experience with that in terms of managing tuna um, <coughs> fisheries in the high seas pockets but also seabed mining is seeing a lot of that management in the high seas so um, as it, it may not necessarily be kind of the, the wild, wild west in terms of how the rest of the 70% of the exclusive economic zones is being managed, um, but it, it is being managed in some way. Um, so yeah, boundaries everywhere at the moment. So is it the global level um, determining what happens or is it local? From top down, bottom up. <laughs> 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 Oh, I'm going to take the cop-out answer and say it almost goes both ways in terms yeah. of the, the, the global sphere is really, the global blue economy is pushing marine protected areas very heavily. That's kind of a very common theme across a blue economies wherever you look is this idea of marine protected areas. We need to do that. And that really ties back in with the motivation for the blue economy. Um, the blue economy kind of was spurred with recognition that we need to better protect um, and manage our oceans because ocean health is declining. So it kind of ties into that conservation discussion. Um, but also, I mean, in the Pacific context, having um, a, a very specific management of marine areas is not, um, like, it's, a, it's an old, old tradition. Um, it's not nothing new um, for many coastal communities. Um, so it, it kind of does go both ways. And I think it's interesting where that intersects um, yeah. and I think that's kind of where we're starting to find the tensions um, yeah I think perfectly said um, <laughs> in terms of the Pacific I think the Pacific has always sort of stressed that notion that it needs to be contextualized to its you know setting um, not just for the blue economy but for development in general mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that push from the bottom has always been there um, and at the same time you know there's a combination and like Pip said um, where they intersect or meet is where there's a lot of murky areas that we need to um, determine going forward have dialogue mm -hmm. our time is up I'm going to throw you one last surprise question and this is where you have to lay your money on the table and say, all right, blue economy, is it promise <laughs> or potential? <laughs> you only choose one. <laughs> no, you can choose whatever you like, I'm joking. <laughs> can we choose both? <laughs> you, well, it's up to you, your, your answer. Um, I guess if I were to choose one, uh, I think for me it would be promise because um, a, promise would, a promise takes much more work than potential. To achieve, and you know, promise is more far-fetched than poten than potential. And I think the Pacific still has a lot of work to do, um, which corresponds to um, sort of the higher level of um, work that needs to be done in order to implement or achieve a promise. And I think the, the Blue Pacific, um, with all its bright ideas and and objectives, um, in support of the interests of the region um, still needs more uh, dialogue in terms of what it what it really means for specific countries, including Tonga. So I'd go with promise. Promise. Pip. Uh, for me, I think the blue economy is full of lots of promises. Um, <laughs> I. I'm very cautious as to whether it can effectively deliver those. Um, the, yeah, I, I think it, the Pacific is a really good example of there have been some really great sustainable ocean development initiatives that have happened long before the blue economy, totally separate to the blue economy. Um, it's kind of a question of do we need this new buzzword? Um, is it doing anything different? Is it actually generating better sustainable ocean development? Um, is it helping to accelerate proper sustainable ocean development? Um, or is it kind of this, this strange, um, potentially exploitative um, agenda that's being pushed? Um, so full of lots of promises, um, whether it itself um, is able to deliver on those, I think is, is for me the very big question mark.
if I could just say yes. one last thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that is so true, that your last sentence in terms of capacity, um, implementation capacity, absorptive capacity. Um, the Pacific receives a lot of assistance from developing nations, developed nations in support of their agendas. Um, whether it includes the blue economy or not is um, still a question, but um, Capacity still remains an issue that needs to be improved in support of implementing whatever it is that we want, whether it's a blue economy or not. Um, capacity it ultimately comes down to capacity. So local, building local capacity. So if Pacifica people are driving their blue economies. Yes. Yes. Local ownership of our own development. Yes. yes. <laughs> I think that's great. Well, that's all we have time for today, folks. <laughs> Can you please join me in thanking Amalia and Pip for a wonderful discussion?